Good evening and welcome to the Bloody Scotland Book Club for July. My name is Craig Robertson. I am your host for this evening and I'm joined by three reviewers who are going to go through this month's reads with me and with you. Uh, we want your comments and your questions. If you put them in the box below, we'll get to as many of them as possible. Joining me tonight is Anna Day. Anna works for Perth and Corrupts Council and she is a festival organiser. Good evening, Anna. Hello. Uh, we have Lindsay Adams. Lindsay is a blogger and a blog tour organiser. Last but not least, we have Craig Sisterson, who is a reviewer for magazines and newspapers across the world, who is the founder of the Niall Marsh Prize in his native New Zealand and is a former judge of the McIlvany Prize. If you're wondering why Craig got a much longer review than the others, he is much bigger than me, and that's the only reason. <laughs> Tonight's books, I hope you've been reading this month's books. Uh, they are The Quaker by Liam McIlvany, Black Dog Wasteland by Essie Cosby, and Our Little Cruelties by Liz Nugent. We are going to kick off with The Quaker, and to introduce it, none other than Liam McIlvany himself, who is going to give us a reading. And hopefully by the time he's read, my voice will have come back. Uh, he's going to give us a reading from the book. Well, kia ora from New Zealand. Um, I'd like to thank Bloody Scotland very much for having me along as part of this month's book group. It's uh, a great honour to be part of this session with two of my favourite writers, Liz Nugent and S.A. Cosby. As you know, I'm reading from this book, The Quaker, and I'm just going to read the first page and a half of the prologue, which should be hopefully self-explanatory. That winter, posters of a smart, fair-haired young man smirked out from bus stops and newsagents' doors across the city. The same face looked down from the cork boards of doctors' waiting rooms and the glass display cases in the public libraries. Everyone had their own ideas about the owner of the face. Rumours buzzed like static. The Quaker worked as a storeman at Billsland's Bakery. He was a fitter with the gas board, a welder at Fairfields. The Quaker waited tables at the old bay horse. Some said he was a Yank from the submarines at the Holy Loch. Others said he was a Russian from off the Klondikers. He was a city councillor, the leader half of the Milton Tongs, a parish priest. He had worked with multiple murderer Peter Manuel in the railways. He was Manuel's half-brother, Manuel's cellmate. He'd helped Manuel abscond from Borstal in Coventry or Southport or Beverley or Hull. There were Quaker jokes, told in low voices in work break card schools and the snugs of pubs. The word was magic markered on bus shelters, sprayed on the walls of derelict tenements. It rippled through the swaying crowds on the slopes of Ibrox and Celtic Park, Quaker 3, Polis Nil. His name crept into the street rhymes of children, the chanted stanzas of lassies skipping ropes or bouncing tennis balls on tenement gables. And always there was the poster. If you see him, phone the police. The poster looked like someone you knew, like a word on the tip of your tongue. If you looked long enough, if you half closed your eyes, then the artist's impression with the slick side parting would resolve itself into the face of your milkman, your sister's ex-boyfriend, the man who wrapped your fish supper in the Bluebird Cafe. Thank you to Liam. Uh, for those who don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, Quaker is set in late 60s Glasgow, 1969. It bears a passing resemblance to the uh, so-called Bible John murders. Uh, I thought it was a fabulous book. Craig, I'm going to start on Safe Ground and come to you, because you were uh, one of the judges of the McIlvany Prize that uh, voted that the winner. Um, I, I was also long-listed that year. I haven't read the book, I now know why I didn't win. Um, what, did, what did you make of the Quaker? Well, I loved your book too, Craig. It's, a well, of... <laughs> it's kind of you to say so. Say it again, say it again later. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that really stood out for me about the Quaker is that Liam just creates this incredibly rich, vivid sense of late 1960s Glasgow, which was a city going through changes. And I'm coming from half the world away from New Zealand. I didn't grow up in Scotland. But for me, being an outsider who's spent quite a bit of time in Scotland since I moved to the UK, I definitely felt this like rich sense of place, rich sense of character, and this kind of hovering menace or dread that was over the city in the wake of, in this book, the Quaker killings and, and in real life, the Bible John killings. And I've talked to others, um, crime writers and others, about 
their memories of that time being a child kind of growing up in the aftermath of that and the kind of the folklore about Bible John and everything like that. And I think Liam just did an incredibly great job capturing that in this really rich, multi-layered novel. He's got this singular kind of detective who's kind of does things his own way and stands a little bit apart in a number of ways that I'm sure we'll dive into. And um, chasing a serial killer, which isn't an uncommon arc in crime fiction, singular detective chasing a serial killer. But Liam just adds all these lovely nuances in. I love the way he brought some of the female victims' voices in. We can dive into that later. But I want to let Anna and Lindsay a chance to chat. I could chat about this for a while. I think it's a marvelous book. I know you can. <laughs> I've now realized it was my mistake going to you too early because you've answered some of my questions already. Uh, Lindsay, what was your overall impression of the book? I loved the, the, the book. Um, I read it a, a few years ago when it first came out. And then obviously, um, I can now say I was actually one of the original readers um, that got to read um, the, the Quaker when obviously for the, the Bloody Scotland Prize and I absolutely um, loved it then as well and I gave it the, the 10 out of 10 and obviously Craig's as well because I did um, enjoyed Craig's one um, but it was just absolutely amazing at the time and then obviously getting the opportunity to reread it I mean it was just you you pick up on things that you missed the first time around I mean you always like you always knew like kind of like the Bible John murders and then always knew the Quaker had that sort of connection to it but obviously and then makes you want to go back and like read it a little bit more into actually the 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 original like uh, Bible John murders and like seeing like the comparisons to what um, Liam did and that kind kind of stuff but I, I absolutely enjoyed rereading it it's one of these books that you can go away from for for like a year and stuff and then re-pick up and then experience new things that you didn't experience the first time you read it. Anna, do you make it three out of three on, on this one? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Again, I read it whenever it was that it came out. Um, and <coughs> I, my memory is so rubbish that it did feel like I was reading an entirely new book. I thought I'd be sort of refreshing when I reread it, actually. It felt like I was reading a, a new book from the start. I think I'm probably less um, entirely glowing. There's elements of it that I felt really were overly complicated for me. I felt we probably could have cut some of it. There's a lot of characters in there um, and I didn't feel that we really got to know McCormack, the uh, main character, particularly well. So I, you know, while I really enjoyed it and I probably gave it 9.5 out of 10, there were other elements of it that I did feel, you know, could have had a, a really uh, thorough edit just to bring some of it back a little bit. And I did like the eyes of the victims and I actually read a bit about why Liam McIlvany did that. It's because he didn't feel hugely comfortable with that idea of you know, the serial killer and the women as victims kind of, you know, that trope. So he wanted to give the victims a voice. Um, and I did, I did like it, but again, it was a, yet another layer um, and the same with the adding in the fourth murder, which wasn't a Bible John murder. So Bible John killed three women. They were at the bar line. So those bits were sort of taken from reality, but he wanted to move it on a bit. Yeah, and I felt that extra murder was, yeah, for me, it was, it just took it over the edge, but I did, I really enjoyed it. I think any author would be glad a nine and a half out of 10. So I don't think, I don't think Liam would mind too much if he loses half a point. Um, well, let's talk about the characters. Uh, so the I, Duncan McCormack is the main voice. You're right, that, that it's a quite character heavy book. But I felt we got enough of him. Um, his voice came through and I think got stronger as the book went on and, and things that drove him. And it's, but I think Liam did make that attempt to uh, balance the victims. We've got some questions already, which is a good reminder to me for any of you, send us your questions, drop us comments and questions. Uh, and the three we've got are really similar so far. Um, from Louise Fairburn, from Louise Cobb and Mary Pickin, and loving the fact that uh, the victims were given a voice. And I think it's something, uh, Craig will come to you, it's too easy for us as crime artists to ignore the victims a bit more. Um, so I think that was a strength on his part. Yeah, I think, I think Anna hit the nail on the head, and I, I've read the same piece that Anna has, I think, or one of the pieces Liam wrote at the time. He wrote a blog post and talked about it, and 
a couple of interviews and Liam and I discussed it at the time for an interview in a New Zealand magazine as well. And I think he felt really uncomfortable with that, you know, male detective, male serial killer, the woman just moving parts that kickstart the, the chase, so to speak. Um, and he wanted to make them a much bigger voice. While at the same time, it is difficult because you're being genuine to the times and late, you know, late 1960s, 1969. And we saw that <coughs> Denise Minor, another brilliant Scottish author who so much of her books are very strong female characters. But when she wrote The Long Drop, which was set in historic Glasgow and won the Macaroni Prize the year before, that was a very masculine book, especially from Denise and she even talked about that. So if anyone can hear background noise, we're just having a thunderstorm here in London. <laughs> Sorry, the windows are all open. Um, so I think Liam, struggled with that and that's why he wanted to do that and I think he was a little concerned because that kind of ghostly spectral thing in a crime novel but I think he did it really well and he's such a fine writer like setting aside character and setting in that he just writes really lovely sentences and really lovely paragraphs he brings that literary quality that another McElvaney did who the prize is well, well let's let's roll with that because I thought that I I loved the prose I thought the prose was so rich and descriptive and crackled and even someone eating became a, a, a joy in itself because you were there. Lindsay, what did you think about that part of the book, about Liam's prose? I enjoyed it. I mean, it's it kind of makes an author unique, maybe. Um, uh, it's kind of, you know, one of the things that you can kind of like draw from when we go, oh, well, that's a sort of like an interesting novel, a different way to do it, because as, as you said, there are so many different like crime authors set in a, uh, the same like Glasgow or Edinburgh and now a lot of them are now doing like Into the Past so like Denise Miner is it see some people call her Mina some people call Miner but you know obviously going into like the historical crime and sort of like taking like the Bible John murders Peter Manuel because they're like and putting a unique spin on it and I think it just makes it a Liam McIlvany novel and something that people will obviously go, oh, well, that's something different. Or I was really drawn to the way, way he writes because it's like a unique spin on, and a unique spin on something that maybe had been done before or like it's like a, a big thing just now. It makes it, people go, well, oh, that's the Quaker. And I know that was written by Liam McIlvany. Yeah, I think there, it definitely has a very distinct style in it. And I, I, and I think it lent itself to the book that it helped, <clears throat> he used it to capture the evocation of, of that time, I thought, yeah, brilliantly. Yeah. Glasgow as a character was, a, you know, an incredible sort of set. Uh, he really brought that to life. You could smell it, you could feel like, you know, I mean, I lived in Glasgow, I love Glasgow, but I never quite see it the same way having reread this book. Um, but yeah, I thought, it, and when we're talking about, you know, that, uh, serial killer and the maleness and actually it's his language and his use of a description that really takes it from being yet another serial killer book to being something quite special and I do think I you know I really think this is a, a great literary crime novel I can't wait to see his next one yeah I agree I mean uh, of the four of us I'm nearest to I have known what it was like in Glasgow at that time on by the Virtue of being the oldest, but I think that it, that way of showing Glasgow crumbling and rebuilding itself um, at that time really suited the novel, and I think we managed to capture it. We had um, when we posted about the books earlier in the month, we had some questions, and I'm afraid I can't remember who asked it about research and how much research Liam did to capture that time. And I asked him that very question last night, and he spent a lot of time as D.I. McCormick did in the Mitchell Library, poring over things to, to get everything right. Uh, and, and also talking to police officers from the time. So uh, Craig, you felt that research bore uh, through, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and as I say, I'm speaking as someone who comes from the opposite side of the world, who really only knows about Scotland of that time through TV and, and film and stuff like that. But um, I felt it was a really strong, and I love, I think, uh, what Anna said about it being a character, like uh, Glasgow was a character in the book, um, one of many characters, as she pointed out. Uh, side note, we will learn more about uh, 
the I am McCormick and the Heretic, which is coming out early next year. Like the Olympic cycle, Liam comes back about every four years. <laughs> He's a slow motion crime writer, but that's something to look forward to, uh, the heretic. So hopefully we will learn more about the I'm a comic in that. But yeah, I love that. Anna nailed it. Glasgow was a character, and especially not late 1960s Glasgow. Um, I know you've already said you, there was a couple of things you weren't entirely happy with. What else? Could somebody else find me something? I'm not looking for the negatives, but Craig or Anna, anything else that you weren't as happy about in the book? Um, well, I can see how, because the, the crime world is so broad nowadays, and you're involved in lots of groups and that online, and, and a lot of people like the really fast-paced crime novels that just action, 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 and Liam kind of luxuriates in the character and setting, which I personally <coughs> really love, but it won't be for every crime reader. So if I get someone coming to me saying, hey, I love James Patterson, can you recommend a crime novel to me? The Quake is probably not the first one I'm going to recommend, even though it's, a, a, like, as you say, it's a 10 out of 10 or a 9.5 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10. So it, as much as I love it, it won't be for everyone because it is very kind of luxuriating in that sense of time and place and character. Okay, we've got another comment from Louise Fairburn, who says, I find this style helped me not feel like I was reading a, in quotes, historical novel. There's enough descriptions of phone boxes and so on to show the period, but not so much that it intrudes. I, I think that's right, because it's, it's e the easy trap as a writer to fall into is to get all this research and then use it all and just show off the thing to learn. And I think, Lindsay, that he was light-handed in the way he used it, but enough to, to take you there. Yeah, I was also just going to bring up, it must be hard for Liam as well, because obviously he had, he had to like live in the shadow of his dad. Don't know about Shadow, but you yeah, might not like that. But uh, yeah, no, it, yeah. it's a factor, I'm sure. He's a favourite taller than Willie was. <laughs> but, so. Yeah. I mean, even if he didn't, I mean, because I have obviously spoken to Liam um, and interviewed him, uh, <clears throat> um, but it must be really, really hard with that comparison to having to have people go, oh, Michael Vanny, or are you? And then find out, yes, and it's like, okay, I'm a crime author, and you're like, all oh, right, okay, so you must have that sort of like people, reader must have that expectation that it's going to be somehow like laid law in some sort of like way. And then, but then I think Liam put his completely own spin on it with McCormack. You know, you could say, yes, it was a Glasgow set crime novel, it was, you know, it was like vintage, it was like vintage, but there was like that unique Liam spin. And um, it's, a, it's a good point, actually, and it was exactly where I was going to go next is that. Um, McCormick is very different from Laid Low. Um, what did we think about uh, the use of McCormick's sexuality? And I come to you and I'll throw you a turquoise on that one. Yeah, I, I, one of the things I thought about was the element of judginess, which is probably not a great literary word, but you know that idea that we judge the women because they were married or they were single mums. You know, they were women who had children. So what were they doing out of the dancing? What were they doing out? You know, with this man you know one of them certainly was married and had a husband waiting at home um, and it felt that extended almost into McCormack and whether you judged his sexuality which as a reader now very few would judge sexuality but obviously uh, back in the 60s it was an issue it, you know it was something that would be judged and would be a, a point of shame in the same way that those women were shamed for the actions that they took so I, I was interested in the parallels between the Cormac and the women, whether that was why he took the case to heart and whether he championed them um, in the way that he did and uh, that. So, yeah, so I, I think that was an interesting element. Um, and also, you know, gay, uh, gay detectives, gay policemen isn't something that I think is commonplace. We've, you know, there's lots of alcoholics, there's you know, lots of people with issues that are our main characters that we know and love, but uh, not one that I know particularly well. So I think that that brings a different spin to it as well. Same question for you, Craig. I felt like Lane brought a very light touch to that. He didn't labour. No, uh, that, it was so. there and you knew and it came through, but it wasn't ladled on at all. It, it was seasoned slightly, you know, not nicely soldered. Um, 
Yeah, I thought he I thought he handled it really well and really delicately because it would be easy to go overboard on that to kind of go, look how isolated this guy is, look how everyone's against him, and kind of really go down that because that helps set up the drama. But I thought Liam just hit a really really nice balance in the same way that um one of the prior bloody Scotland book club choices, City of Vengeance by D. V. Bishop, an excellent novel set back in um, Renaissance Florence, and that detective was also gay, but obviously the even even stronger outcomes for him if that comes out then and um but in the same way i thought both liam and david did that really really well and as as they uh, Anna and Lindsay have said it's it's not common in crime fiction yeah. when you think how many crime novels are out there and how many great novels are out there there's not a whole lot of um gay protagonists especially male yeah. protagonists. no although i suspect we'll see more uh and very slowly okay so that is the quaker i think we're all agreed um 10 out of 10, 9 and a half out of 10. Um, it's a high bar to start with. We're going to move on to book number two, uh, which is Black Tall Wasteland by S.E. Cosby, Sean Cosby. And again, Sean is going to read for us. So uh, sit back and enjoy. Beauregard thought the night sky looked like a painting. Laughter filled the air, only to be drowned out by a cacophony of revving en engines as the moon slid from behind the clouds. The bass from the sound system in a nearby Chevelle was hitting him in the chest so hard it felt like someone was performing CPR on him. There were about a dozen other late model cars parked haphazardly in front of the old convenience store. In addition to the Chevelle, there was a Maverick, two Impalas, a few Camaros, and five or six more examples of the heyday of American muscle. The air was cool and filled with the scent of gas and oil, the rich acrid smell of exhaust fumes and burnt rubber. A choir of crickets and whippoorwills tried in vain to be heard. Beauregard closed his eyes and strained his ears. He could hear them, but just barely. They were screaming for love. He thought a lot of people spent a large part of their life doing the same thing. The wind caught the sign hanging above his head from the arm of a pole that extended 20 feet into the air. It creaked in the breeze as it moved back and forth. Carter Speedy Mart. The sign proclaimed in big black letters set against a white background. The sign be was beginning to yellow with age, the letters worn and chipped. The cheap paint flaking away like dry, dried skin. The second E had disappeared from the word speedy. Beauregard wondered what happened to Carter. He wondered if he had disappeared too. Ain't none of y'all ready for my legendary old. Y'all might go on back home to your ugly wives. For real, though, y'all ain't got nothing for the legendary olds. She does 60 a second, $500 line to line. Huh, y'all mighty quiet. Come on, the olds done sent a many a boy home with their pockets lighter. I done outrode more cops than the Duke boys and the olds. You ain't just beating the olds, homeboy. A guy named Warren Crocker crowed. He was strutting around his 76 old Bill Cutlass. It was a beautiful car, dark green body with chrome mag rims and chrome trim that ran across its surface like liquid lightning. Smoked out glass and LED lights emitted an ethereal bluish glow like some bioluminescent sea creature. I was enjoying that so much. I'm just probably didn't finish. I was, I was getting right into that bit. Um, Black Hole Wasteland tells the story of Beauregard Montage, who is a driver has been in the life, uh, who was a criminal who's been going straight. Uh, times are getting harder, he's a squeeze on for finance, and he has to do one more job. Incredibly different book from the Quaker, Anna, but again, a real voice driving. Tell me, tell me what you thought of the book. So I have quite complicated feelings about this book. So we, I, I chair a lot of different events, and you get given books and you read them. And quite often they're things that you wouldn't naturally pick up. So I would never, ever read this book. And I had to, I couldn't, so I read before I go to my bed. And quite often I wake up in the middle of the night and I read a few pages. This was the single most stressful book I've ever read. It, <laughs> I, I don't watch like thriller films. So it, it felt like a movie in a book. And it is, yeah. I, I looked it up, it is being made into a film. And that totally makes sense but I actually found it quite a stressful reading experience. And I think the writing was brilliant and the story was great. And I read somewhere that he's a chess player and that totally makes sense because it was so 
complex and the pieces fell into place. But I, you know, whether I actually enjoyed reading it, I think would be a really difficult thing to say that it, I found it an enjoyable experience. So yeah, while, while I can see the absolute class and merit in it, it wasn't a fun uh, nighttime read. It was really okay, let's stick with that a bit. So when it was a stressful thing to read, I, I get that. But in many ways, that would have been his intention yeah. um, to put you on edge. So did you feel on edge? But you maybe didn't feel comfortable being on that edge. It was not necessarily a good edge for you. I think he did a brilliant job. I think he's obviously a great writer. I would probably, and I ended up reading it on holiday where I had time during the day. And that was a much more pleasant experience. Um, and I probably would read his next one sitting on a beach somewhere. I wouldn't read it as I was falling asleep. Um, so yeah, but I can see the absolute class in his writing. I thought Bug was a brilliant character. You know, he was really deep and complex and you uh, hated him and also admired him. And that, you know, that's a difficult balance to get right. Um, and I think when we talk about the next book, we can talk about the fact that none of these books have characters, main characters that you completely love. Um, you know, McCormack was complex and quite cold in lots of ways, and Bug is a really difficult character to love, but he's, you know, he's still got these stellar qualities about him as well. Yeah, I agree with all that, and I think we should definitely come back on this idea of likeable characters, and there's, I think there's a real skill to put you on side of someone you don't agree with, and you might cross the street to avoid. Yeah. Lizzie, what was your overall impressions of Blacktop Wasteland? Um, I was pleasantly surprised because I, as, as I said before, when we were chatting, it's not one of the books that if somebody had given to me, I'd have gone, whoa, that's going to be on my TBR pile for, you know, that's going to make me excited. No offence to, to Sean, the, um, um, to, to read, because I really, I really, I'm a big fan of like Fast and Furious because I actually always like Amazon, Go I shouldn't really, I always like, like blurb it to see what it was about and it kept, sounded like Fast and Furious and I never really got into those films and I thought right okay I have to do it for this so uh, I picked up on the Kindle and I started reading it so I used it when I was reading one well, of my days off of I was going into because we get to travel yeah you so get to visit friends get to go to Edinburgh and stuff so using it on the bus um, I was on holiday last week so I was reading it on the train down to Newcastle and I can see where it's coming from about it would be a book definitely I wouldn't have been sitting reading at night time because it is that kind of on your edge kind of book it was nice kind of like to put in like an hour and just like read like uh like say 10 to 20 percent of the book and then you know in the next bit but it, it was a good rate a read it kept uh, the highs and the adrenaline going you were kind of like getting to this point we thought right this is where it's going to go wrong for them you know they're never going to get it and then um and then it went over and thought, all oh, right, okay, maybe it's going to go, it's going to, then of course... Well, let's not give too many end spoils oh, in case somebody just <laughs> not quite got to the end yet or get it. But you're right, it is an absolutely high adrenaline book and it, it is not a calming last thing before bed kind of experience. But nor, Craig, I think is it quite, I, I get Lynch's point about Fast and Furious, but this is somewhat deeper and more nuanced than that. There's a, there's a lot more going on, isn't there? Yeah, I think anyone who's seen me talk on pretty much any online thing the last year or follows me on Twitter knows how I feel about this book because I was raving about it from before it came out. Um, and I think Sean is the breakout crime writer of the pandemic in terms of just quality and stuff like that and his new ones. But fucking phenomenal. Raise my tears, it's even better. Um, I think the thing that really, there's so much you could talk about with this book, but I think the thing that got me is that it's a heist thriller, like Lindsay and Anna have said, you're kind of fast and furious, or Ocean's Eleven perhaps, is that kind of heist, trying to pull off a heist. But then it's this really deep, rich meditation that's kind of got that southern gothic, southern rural noir of a James Lee Burke or a John Hart or a Wiley Cash kind of layered in. But it's also bringing a black working class perspective to the southern gothic tradition, which you have not seen hardly any of ever so it's there's so much layered and going on this and you can read it just from an exciting incredibly tense as Anna's pointed out incredibly tense exciting lots of events happening kind of heist thriller goes heist goes wrong but for me the things I really loved about it 
was that underlying kind of bubbling away, that undercurrent of race relations, of masculinity, of fatherhood, of um, the American South and what it means to be a working class man in the American South. And on top of all of that, Sean just writes fucking brilliantly when it comes to sentences and prose and stuff. He read that passage, that passage is the very first page of the book. Um, just what I'm speaking, I was given an opportunity to uh, be a guest lecturer at an Australian uh, crime writing course online, obviously, because we were all in lockdown. And I used uh, the start of three or four books to talk about the different ways that the students could start and grab the reader's attention. And I actually used this when it had just come out because I liked it so much. And I think it was that line, I've got it here in front of me, because I'm not super into cars. Like I like cars, but I'm not super into it at all. So the car thing was like, yeah, this is interesting. And then it was the a choir of crickets and whipper pools tried in vain to be heard. Beauregard closed his eyes, strained his ears. He could hear them, but just barely they were screaming for love. He thought a lot of people spent a large part of their life doing the same thing. That's the end of the first paragraph. He had me from that, and then it just got Yeah, I, I was in there as well. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk about was that, and this is somewhat anecdotal, but when people talk to me about the book and like it or not, there's quite often a bit of a gender split, mm. and which surprised me a bit going into it. So I don't know whether it's the cars thing, mm. but um, I'm not into cars at all. I have virtually no interest as long as you can get me there. But generally, I'm getting a much more positive reaction on this book from men than from women. But like you guys, once you were sort of forced to read it, it was different. Do you think there is, Anna, do you think there is a, a more uh, of a man's book? I, I mean, there's such not, a thing, first of all. I suppose if you're going to pick quotes in it, there's not a um, particularly visible female character. Um, you know, his wife is obviously a minor character. And then there's the, I think, Jenny, who's the girl who sets up the heist. So. Yeah. There, but there isn't a strong female lead. So, but that that doesn't make me read or not read a book or enjoy or not enjoy a book. So I think it is partly that adrenaline thing, and maybe it comes down to something about you know how women and we're being really overly general here, but you know where women read and how they read and what they want to read for. Um, and so yeah, for me, it is about a relaxation at the end of the day, and this book is not about relaxation. So. You know that that is possibly it, but as you say, when you do pick it up and you do read it, it is. It, I think it's dialogues what got me actually, and I don't have any examples of it in front of me, but everybody's got a really distinct voice, but yeah. yet they all sort of weave together really well. So it was his dialogue that was the the strength. Um, and the Rod, Ronnie and Reggie did make me laugh quite a lot. Um, so yeah, so I think m maybe that's what it is, but maybe it's just the Maybe the blurb is making women feel that it's more of a... Maybe, maybe. Lindsay, did you feel it suffered from not having a strong female character? The, the female characters are either sort of add-ons to, to Beauregard or, or victims. Not really. There, there's a lot of books that, that are like that. For, for me, I think it, Anna's touched on the fact that it's the blurb. The blurb does, does have... A downside in the fact that obviously the first thing you immediately go to is the like heist like Ocean Eleven, Ocean, um, you know the Ocean films, and then you think of Fast and Furious. It's just that you know the car and the heist, and that's I think what obviously makes everybody think right. This is a novel for a man, and it doesn't really matter. That there's really not a strong female character. I, I don't really okay. think. I mean, the characters do shine through the women, but it, it is it's just that that blurb just that's just the immediate thing that you, you you think of when when you get it up and you're like right okay mm. but I mean there there is a really strong relationship I mean for people who haven't read you know Bo got Bo um and his uh, and his mum and the relationship between him and his wife and his him and his daughter there is that strong so he, he's he's like a character with like two sides to him where. He's got the, you know, like the the tough guy, and then he's got that sort of loving, sweet side with his sons and his mum. Well, the way his mum treats him is pretty yeah. cool, but you know, he's, this character's kind of got the, the it's like the good angel and the bad devil and the good angel in his shoulder, and it's kind of like that shift between what he's actually um, going to portray himself as. Well, that's a really good point. Um, so that's where I wanted to go next. So. None of the characters in this book, apart from some of the women, are, are on the right side of the law. Um, they're all basically criminals, yet 
I think we're rooting for Bug. We're on his side. Are we all comfortable about Craig being on the side of the bad guys? Yeah, I think in the in this case, um, and I just typed, kind of kicking off from what Lindsay said, I actually wrote a note to myself before this, and I hadn't thought of it when I originally read the book last year. I talked about the kind of bug versus by regard dichotomy, but it, it didn't strike me until I was doing it for the Bloody Scotland Book Club, is that there is that kind of, it's not quite Jekyll and Hyde, but there's that sense of good and evil within the character, which is a very Scottish crime writing thing. Yeah. That sense of duality going back to Stevenson, going back to Confessions of an Unjustified Sinner and all of that, which is kind of embeds through Tart and La. And I hadn't really kind of made the connection until I was reading it for this, that um, uh, Sean kind of does that with an American Southern Gothic novel, kind of a Southern Gothic novel, which was really interesting. And yeah, yeah I didn't find... Um, I just found Bug to be very human as like a working class black man in the American South. But that, that was a strength, wasn't it? That, it, that yeah. he is, he comes in shades. And it's, all good no one's all bad. And that you see yeah. those nuances and the drives as well. And he was doing it for, you know, for his family. He was doing it for his kids. He was being pulled back in. And he was someone who was trying to be a good person, but had a dark or angry or um, violent side. And I think... But, sure, yeah, Sean does violence brilliantly because, um, or you say Cosby, his name's Sean, um, does violence brilliantly because violence in crime fiction is a really interesting thing. And there's a lot of people who have violence and make it kind of fun. It's like a fight and everyone walks away and it's kind of exciting, like a James Bond thing. Sean does very real violence where like people are hurt and they're hit with wrenches and it's, and even the winner comes out of it really badly and violence is not fun. And he makes that very clear in both this book and Raise Away Tears. And I think he just has a really nice touch for it. So people might think of the books as really violent because people get hit with wrenches and stuff. But in a way he kind of, he doesn't like luxuriate in the violence. Like, no, I think you're, good. you're right because books for me that um, when it's almost cartoon like violence and it's well, that's nothing. It's just someone having their head cut off. You know, but he, he, it's very clear, Anna, that it's, this is, not good. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that sort of caught me by surprise is that there's so much, you know, when their violence is graphic, it does tend to be almost cartoonish in a lot of cases. And this was so real. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, I think that's one of the things that caught me unawares almost was that feeling of, you know, how uh, how deep in the, oh yeah, totally got me. So. Right, we have some comments. Um, First of all, Mary Pickin, well, we've got three from, so Mary loved Sean's reading, I did too. Um, Ron McCarram says, uh, of the reading, great description, felt I was in Virginia, I even felt interested in the cars, and liked how the main character was a criminal and how he had little choice. Mary again picks up on that, and I think it reflects what we're saying, that these are not bad people, these are people without any easy choices. And it's, I think he does take us there, Craig, as you said, places that we haven't been often, and that, that working class southern landscape where people's choices are more limited. Anyone? All right, well, just say I'm right, and that's fine. Yeah, no, no, um, no, no. Yeah. I was giving the girls a chance to talk because I could talk <laughs> oh. for hours about this. Book. Oh, we don't. <laughs> Lindsay, go on. You're all, you're all, uh, you know, I like to chat as well, but, but and you just try to pull back because people say, oh, you, you're overtaking people and you're like, right, okay, I'm pulling back. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know what you, you mean. You do feel like with, with I called him Bo, I'm really sorry, it's Bug, sorry, my, uh, uh, but um, you do feel that he doesn't want to do, Bug doesn't want to get involved in this. Um, he's hesitant to get involved with these guys because he's been burnt by them before. And obviously he wants, to, but obviously the situation with, you know, life um is throwing um garbage basically and this is this is a way of you know like providing the future for his sons for his daughter for his family and you know he's thrown back into that life and you, you just get that feeling that he doesn't want to do it but his circumstances throws him back in so in a way he it, you, you, you're right it's just it's it's a extremely complicated Com complex yeah, and i think sean he sets it up he takes i think about four chapters five chapters maybe the choice why Bug yeah. or regard has to go back in there. Um, another comment from Fiona Milligan, who says, I love that the cars, particularly his father's car, were like characters and described characterized so beautifully. I absolutely loved it. I would not normally have picked something like this to read. So thank you for introducing it to me. Fiona, you're very welcome. I'm hoping that's one of the strengths of the book club is that we're almost forcing you to read different books each time and hopefully taking it different places. 
Um, we're about time on Black or Wasteland. One thing for me, though, as, as an author, that the prose, I just felt absolutely crackled and jumped off the page. And he was an absolute master of the voice. And he, he had that in his grasp the whole time. I never let it go for a second. It snarls. Like, his prose snarls. Like, you don't want to make the, the kind of obvious metaphor to, like, a car engine. But it, but it, it does. It snarls. And, and I hate... I hate the phrase transcends the genre because it implies that the genre doesn't already have all this amazing richness and it can do all these amazing things. So anytime a literary novelist comes in, oh, it transcends the genre, bullshit. There's tons of amazing ground writing. But I do think Sean enriches and elevates our genre. I think he's, yeah. he's a top shelf writer. And Absolutely. I, I, so I, I, we're going to hear a lot, lot more of them, no question oh, about that. Um, as you see... I would just like to point out to people because you know you can get the kind of overnight success thing. He's like broken through in the pandemic, and like you say, film deal, Razor Blade Tears have come out, New York Times bestseller. He's won awards and been shortlisted for awards. Um, I had a chance to talk to Sean earlier this year um, for an interview. Uh, he's 47 now, and he started running when he was 20, and he's so this is a this is a quarter century to overnight success for him. He is Jews, as they say. He is really. Okay. I'm so glad for him. Everything good that's happening, he deserves it. Oh, definitely. But from what you were saying about this being transcending the genre and it's been a very broad church, I think, well, the three books tonight prove it. The third one certainly does. Uh, we are going to go on to Our Little Cruelties by Liz Nugent. And Liz is going to read us something from it now. All three of the drum brothers were at the funeral, although one of us was in the coffin. Three is an odd number, so there had always been two against one, although we all switched sides regularly. Nobody would ever have described us as close. As the service began, I became tearful. Without ever realising it, I had inherited my mother's acting abilities. My living brother and I stood side by side at the top of the crematorium while people lied to us about what a brilliant man our brother had been. All the usual meaningless cliches. His death was sudden, horrific. The investigation was quick and conclusive. I was not a suspect. I had a sense of freedom and relief I hadn't felt in quite a while. I didn't expect that this air of serenity would last, but I thought I would enjoy it while I could. My surviving brother was unreadable to me. Maybe he was thinking of our brother's smashed and broken body. Still, even he must have known that this outcome was all for the best. Daisy sat in the pew behind us. She seemed not to be aware of her surroundings, fidgeting and whispering to herself. I caught my brother's eye as her babbling became audible and people began to notice. He reached out and quietly asked her to join us. That reaching out of his hand made me shudder momentarily. She seemed to return to reality and moved to stand between us without any argument. We both attempted to put a proprietorial arm around her, but she shrugged us off. We brothers looked at each other and the old rivalry resurfaced. Brilliant. Thank you to Liz Nugent for that. Lindsay, oh, sorry, before we kick off you, I should say what the book's about, just to make sure everybody's up to date. A little cruel taste of the story of the Drum Brothers, three of them who uh, inflict many cruelties upon each other. As we know, one is dead. The story is told in three parts by William, Luke and Brian, and it's quite a journey. Lindsay, what did you make of it? I was... It was another one that I was kind of like, oh, it's not one that I would have picked up. Um, again, I made the mistake of looking at Amazon and you, you you can just try not to look at the reviews people leave. And then I picked it up and I was pleasantly surprised. I must admit, I was like, as we've already said, uh, fail, I can see it mm, maybe being a crime, the, the, the murder, the star and all that. And then you kind of think, all right, OK. It kind of goes in the, the three parts told, told through the the brothers, but you just feel that 
it's more about like that sort of dark past that has like haunted each of the brothers like from their mother and treatment towards them and how they've obviously treated each other through the years and it's not just like like the Quakers obviously like serial killers so there's killings and then uh, Blacktop Wasteland you've got obviously got the violence this one is like that sort of like complex sort of like dark um uh, like psychological kind of like um crime I think that the best way to describe it because it isn't in your face like you you know there's no really violence except for like past uh, there's not really any sort of like 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 serial killer murders and it's just the kind of like the sort of like sight you're like looking into people's heads and saying you know like dark places that like families like family stories and family how how dark how dark a family can be kind of everything i'm not really sure how you would describe it i did well, let's see it. let's see if let's see if craig can describe it um because there's no violence craig there's no shortage of emotional violence what did what did what did you make of this yeah and i think uh lindsay and i'm we kind of had a chat before and i thought anna as well um is that people have different definitions of crime I am very much a crime as a big church. Crime is a catch-all for crime mystery thriller a suspense. So half of Shakespeare is crime, in my view, and half a Greek tragedy kind of thing. So I'm very broad view when I say crime. But I know other people like some people like crime and mystery are different, or crime and thriller are different. This is very much a psychological thriller that's kind of an ex a character-centric exploration <coughs> of family dynamics. It's sibling rivalry taken to toxic levels. For me, it's just one of the best examples of domestic noir, if you want to use that term, you know, kind of thing. I think it's an incredible domestic noir or psychological thriller, and that might shelve it a little bit more for people who know what they want. I'm a crime omnivore. I will read anything in the broader crime genre and then just go, do I like it or not? Do I think the writing's great or not? Do I think the story's great or not? The dialogue's great or not? So I really, really enjoyed this, even though, as um, Lindsay says, it's very different to the other two books, which I also really enjoyed. I think Liz is just a fantastic writer. She's a master of, she kind of, she's a master of making rather revolting people, <laughs> rather, rather riveting, like, it's compulsive. I just found myself just chewing through the pages. And I was like, hate these guys, hate these guys, hate these guys, can't stop reading, hate these guys, hate these guys, can't stop reading. And and like Lindsay and I have said, it's, it's not like there's tons of murders or serial killers or any of that kind of stuff to pull you through. It's the character relationships and dynamic. It's very much a, a domestic wire of the highest level, from my mind. And uh, although, uh, as we say, a lack of violence and, and what we call traditional crime, there is no lack of tension, I would think, as the story goes on, because you realise you're hurtling to somewhere not very good. Yeah, but it's not a crime book, and I, you know, and it's just not. We're just going to go there right now, are we? We're just going to go there. It's, you know, a great book, but it is, it's a domestic drama. It's not about a crime, and it's not about people committing a crime. It's not a crime book, and, uh, you know, and does it matter? Nah, not really. Uh, apart from the fact that we're here to discuss crime books, apart, <laughs> doesn't really matter. It's still a great book. And we probably, as in everything in life, get too hung up on giving things labels and putting them in boxes. But, you know, for me, this was not a crime book. And that's fine, because I read all sorts of things all the time. But still going to stick with that. Not a crime book on it. However, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great domestic drama. I thought the three brothers were all absolutely awful. Um, and yet, as Craig says, completely readable and sucked you in and you wanted to know what they did next, despite the fact you also wanted to never hear or see them ever again. So she did a brilliant job with it. And I did really enjoy it, but yeah, not crying. Okay, well, let's just go there. Let's just examine whether there is a crime novel. For me, I'm with Craig. Well, uh, Fables in my church is not that broad in crime novels. If there's any ghosts or zombies, uh, vampires, then there's no, it's not a crime novel. Um, talking cats or dogs, I'm kind of out as well. Um, but I think it's important to know how things happen. And I think what this book was always about was where it's leading and the things that cause it. And it's... Things easy to forget in crime novels is this the nurture, the, the thing that creates people and leads people to do bad things. But as you yeah. said, Anna, they were kind of doing bad things and being 
because they're blaming each other from the off. Um, um, I'm prepared to take it as a crime novel, and I think it's a really good one. I think, as you said, brilliant story and brilliantly told. Um, and we'll always take good books in. Lindsay, for you, crime novel or not crime novel? I, I do think it, because I'm with you guys, it's, it isn't the, as I said before, it isn't your type, Thai cop crime novel. It's psychological thriller to me. It reminds me of Michael Malone, Michael J. Malone from, um, because his books were never like crime, crime. Well, the first lot were like, I <laughs> just wrote, but a lot of the more were like, you know, like, like they didn't have the the one die heart crime. And that's why I think it kind of reminds me of, and I kind of like it. And I like the fact that. You know, you need to know the brother's story to understand how they got to how they get to the, the end kind of style. Because you need to see how with the mum, relationship with the mum, the relationship with their dad, the relationship between each other. Because if you just went straight to the end, you'd be like, well, why did they, they do that to each other? Because yeah. it's just the way each of them. I love the fact that it was told in the different between the different brothers. You had a love hate relationship with each one. Well, young, you thought, all right, okay, yeah, he's like the the film producer and he lives the lifestyle. Luke is like the rock and roll musician and then the, is sponging off them. And it's just kind of different because you like them, you feel sorry for them. And then you're like, I absolutely hate you, you know? And then it's the same with each one. There's bits you love about them, the bits you hate about them and the bits you think, oh my God, you know, you're the worst person ever kind of style. But well, that, it, it just kind of comes and goes. Yeah. I'm going to come right back to that, but first of all, in terms of the crime world, should we worry less about what it's not and more celebrate what it is, um, which is a really great, rich story, well told. Um, so I'm going to ask you that first, and then I'm going to ask you to start talking a bit about the structure of the book. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic that. book, and like Anna says, she, she defines it differently. And, and like when people say crime and thriller, then you definitely put this in the psychological thriller part of thriller, not the crime part. But I kind of use it as an all encompassing genre kind of thing of the crime and thriller genre, separate to romance or separate to sci fi, or separate to fantasy kind of thing. So I think it still comes in that broader picture, but maybe a psych yeah, like you say, psychological thriller, not a crime. And yeah, it doesn't matter. It's a fucking great book. Go read it. It's awesome. Liz is, Liz is great. Like, um, like her earlier books, she, she's just a master at this, like lying away and unraveling Oliver and skin deep. And she takes these, I don't like any of her characters at all, but I love all the books, you know, kind of thing. It's just like. Well, okay, then before we come to structure, which I do want to talk about a little bit, I think when we got initial comments back in the book, when people were starting to read Little Cruelties, um, there was a lot of people saying, oh, I don't like these characters, but I love the book. And, and I think that's a, that's a real skill in itself, because Liz, I spoke to her about this on Saturday. Um, we, we were at Harrogate together, and she says she gets this all the time, that people, but she's not setting out to write likeable characters. And I think it's a skill to engage in with people you don't like. Yeah, I think that's a huge skill, and very few authors can do it. You know, that idea that you're going to follow someone for 300 pages, or none of whom you like, even the kid. The kid's awful in this book. You know, you think the kid's going to be the redeeming kind of character in the book, and they're not. Um, so, yeah, nobody nobody comes out of this well. However, you still want to follow them, and that is such a skill as a writer. And, you know, if you, when you're starting out and you're writing, you know, any agent, not a publisher, will encourage uh, that you have a, a really likable character somewhere in the mix and she's gone completely against that and that is hardcore but also brilliant. Lindsay yeah. what do you think about that issue of unlikable characters? I think that's a good idea because why do we have to have characters that everybody goes oh yeah I love that I love her I love him you know let's just have a book full of characters that you would absolutely hate you wouldn't want them as your friends you wouldn't want them as your family it makes them more readable because you can have so many characters that you absolutely love for and then you have that character in some books the character you absolutely identify with or like you know, is your favorite character, stand character is the, the most awful character. 
it's the one that ev you know that ev that everybody else hates is the character that like stands out for you uh you in the book and come sometimes they shine through the the most but yeah, I, th I think it was quite quite um, interesting. Please have no character that you thought was well, you know, like the um, like the, the the shining light or the someday that's you know the, right, the, the good, from it, yeah. nice to have like this just like dark, just completely dark family because there there are stories of like that where the family is just like rotten to the core, um, and you know, no wonder the the breed like serial killers or like. Um, <laughs> That kind of well, stuff. we've got a comment on that from uh, Sharon Bearden. Uh, uh, Sharon, obviously an author herself, says, uh, Liz is one of my favourite writers. She creates the most vile characters who drag you right into the pages. I agree. Uh, Mary Pickin says, Tos toxic masculinity. I see these guys pinch and poke at each other's weaknesses. Um, having a brother, I know this is exactly how things go in real life. Believe me. Um, Craig, this business of telling from one brother's point of view and you're getting one perspective and then we realized with brother two that maybe not everything was the way the brother one told it and things move on i felt that really worked yeah i mean it, it's rather brilliant and, and i think kind of like a great rock musician or a great musician when you see them on stage and they make something that's incredibly complicated and difficult look really easy and you're like oh yeah all these. and liz kind of does the same liz has a smoothness to her writing and her storytelling that i think belies how complicated some of the things she does and how tricky and how rare they are as Anna said is like it's incredibly difficult to do these kind of things to make you follow a lot of people will try and do this and it will not work at all and Liz is just masterful at that and um it's kind of like I was thinking actually uh Liam who we were talking about earlier has recently been Twitter posting he's been re-watching The Sopranos from the start and I think that's such a great example because The Sopranos is a groundbreaking television series that was very much in this ilk where Tony Soprano is not a nice guy and there might be little little moments here and there where you get little flashes of like oh he's interesting and he's fascinating but all of those guys are fucking terrible like when you actually think about it and but we followed it for years and years and we still talk about it 20 years later kind of thing and I think Liz, Liz does that really masterfully but sorry going back to your question about the three perspectives um it's really interesting too because Liz many people probably don't realize this she's a pantser she is not a plotter at all she just yeah, down and, and that's up. maddening it's reading that, that she's not plotted that. All the layers she has and the complexity, she's fucking genius, really. If you think there's some of these things that yeah, I, and as I again as a writer, I'll look for a thing. Yeah, I know that's what's going to happen, and she caught me out a whole bunch of times. And uh, shit, yeah, I didn't see that coming. And upturned expectations all the time, and she's not plotting this out on a whiteboard. She's just she's a genius. She's a mad Irish genius. The other thing that Anna, I think that she did really well and it kept catching me out was in this really dark book was just, it was so funny. You know, they're just for these laugh out loud moments of the brothers um, and from their perspective. Did that get you in some way? Yeah, no, I, and it, I think that's what saved it as well. It's moments of lightness as well, that um, if it had just been the darkness, it possibly wouldn't have worked and you wouldn't have been taken on that journey with these guys. So you know, those moments where she brought in the funny and brought in the lightness were the ones that kind of kept you going, kept you interested in them. So, yeah, I, I think she does that very well, um, too. I agree. I mean, I thought it was hilarious. The number of times I burst out laughing uh, surprised me. Now, uh, that brings us to the end of tonight's discussion. Um, I think we set the bar pretty high for <laughs> next month. I do not yet know what next month's books are. But we're going to find out because I would like to welcome the wonderful Jenny Brown to join us. Hello, Jenny. How are you? Very good. Pr brilliant discussion, everybody. I really enjoyed that. Three more books for my list. But in August, we are going to further challenge your definition of what constitutes a crime novel. Um, we've got a fabulous lineup. This is your three books that we are going to recommend you read in August. We meet on August the 25th, Wednesday, August the 25th at 7 p.m. We've got Deity by Matt Velazowski. He, of course, was the 2015 winner of our Pitch Perfect competition with the beginning of his six stories. So fantastic to see this next episode um, of that long running series. We have also When the Dead Come Calling by Helen Sedgwick, the Highland-based writer. This is the first in her Burrowhead Mysteries series published by Point Blank. 
and we're inviting you all to to read that one and finally you've seen the film now read the book if you haven't before the talented mr ripley by patricia highsmith by the way in case you're interested I see it's 99 pence on Kindle at the moment, <laughs> but you could scour your secondhand bookshops or buy a new copy, of course, um, of this one. I could hardly sit through that movie. I don't know about the rest of you. So I'm going to be very, very interested to read the actual text. So those are the three we've got for August. It's warming you all up brilliantly for Bloody Scotland in September. Uh, that'll be, this will be our last book club before the festival and um, I really hope you enjoy August's reading. Danny, thank you. Uh, that are three sneaky choices. I, I'm looking forward to see how this goes. They're three excellent books. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you for all tuning in tonight. I would like a huge thanks to Anna, to Lindsay, to Craig, for Jenny for joining us. Uh, enjoy next month's books. I've been Craig Robertson. Thank you and good night. <laughs>